Well, hello there, and welcome to the Pastor Mike Drop Podcast. My name is Mike Householder, and I am your host and in desperate need of a haircut. Uh, I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Emily Langpaul. Hello, Emily. Hello. And we have a distinguished... I'm so excited about this episode. Yeah. Uh, we have a distinguished guest, my, my friend... Uh, Simon Estes is here today. Emily, that's usually you. I just took your introduction, didn't that's I? Okay. But hey, Simon uh, is uh, Iowa's favorite son, an internationally acclaimed opera star. And Simon, we're so glad to have you uh, here on this uh, episode of the podcast today. Thank you for joining us. I'm honored to be here. The only thing I have one correction: I'm not a star. Quite you often, are. people say, "How does it feel to be a star?" And I always say. I'm not a star. The stars are in heaven. God put them there. <laughs> and I'm just a human being who's been blessed. This is why I love Simon Estes. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we get together, and I'm blessed to be Simon's pastor, and so we get together and we have these conversations, and they always go deep, and they're always about scripture and theology and all these things. And I thought, let's bring this to uh, the podcast and and bring our conversations here. So Simon, as... As I've said publicly uh, at different events, Simon gets honored a lot, as mm-hmm. as he deserves. Even though he doesn't think he's a star, he is Iowa's favorite son. And in a very deserving way, he gets honored for his work, uh, for his talent, but also for his generosity, his mm-hmm. phil- philanthropy. Uh, and some of those times, I've, I've been honored, honored to be there and give an invocation or a prayer at those events. And so what I've said there, I'll say here that as impressive as Simon's career has been as an opera singer, singing on the biggest opera stages in the world uh, for years and years and years, and and a breakthrough artist on so many different levels, as as impressive as all of that is, uh, I am even more impressed with uh, the depth of Simon's faith, his integrity, his character, uh, the kind of human being he is, and I'm I'm honored uh, not just that you're here today, Simon, but I'm I'm blessed to call you my friend, and mm-hmm. and uh, you are a mentor to me. So thank you for being here uh, today on this episode, um, Emily. Have you, you've been at Hope for many many years, and so you've heard yeah. Simon sing when yes. he's here, and you know my experience with Simon being here and singing is that there's no uh, that voice is distinguished and it's obvious and you can hear it booming down the hall yes. so you know yes. that Simon's in the building and Simon you've got a sense of humor too you've also been good enough to uh, participate in some of our videos where you've played Darth Vader uh, <laughs> you know br- brought the voice uh, in- into some different things that we've done that are a little bit on the sillier side in addition to uh, singing some offerings uh, during our worship services that are absolutely inspired Uh, by the Holy Spirit. So without further ado, Simon, it's time for our two-minute drill. We've got some questions uh, for you, and we'd like to move through those now. Yeah, two-minute drill. Two-minute drill! Here we go. Simon, the first question is, what was life like for you growing up in Centerville, Iowa? Well, Centerville was a very small coal mining town, and my Mm -hmm. father came there because his father, my grandfather, was a slave, sold for $500. But a lot of people came to Centerville from all over the world. If you'd go out to the graveyard in Centerville, you'd see people's names from all over Europe. And Centerville was like any other small town in Iowa. I was born in 1938 in my little house that was 27 feet by 25 feet. The doctor came out and Dr. Brummett came out and delivered me because colored people couldn't be born in the uh, hospital at that time. Mm. So I grew up in Centerville in a very fundamentally spiritual and religious family. Uh, The colored church was a Baptist church. It was the second Baptist church. We had a first Baptist church, but that was the white Baptist church. But nonetheless, we all had the same God and the same Jesus Christ. And so we grew up in the church Sunday morning and Sunday night and choir rehearsal was Thursday and prayer meeting was Wednesday. So my foundation of my whole life has been upon the Bible, upon the church, upon Christ and on God. And I'm so grateful that I had a Christian mother and a Christian earthly father. My mother was the speaker. My father only had a third grade education. He was born in 1891, and he couldn't read or write. But my mother taught him to read a little bit, and that was just the Bible. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of discrimination that went on in Centerville, but I'm grateful 
that my mother and father taught my three older sisters and me never to hate anyone. You can hate what they do if it's not according to Christ's teachings, but don't hate them as a human being. So that is why to this day, I don't have any hatred in my heart. I don't have room for it. I just have love and that love is God and Jesus Christ. Mm. My goodness, Simon. So I, I didn't know that. I, this is the first I'd heard the part about Second Baptist Church and First Baptist Church. I, I just I find the the beautiful irony in all of that that maybe some of those who um, were at First Baptist Church, if they ever could have fast forwarded and looked into the future mm. and seen, there's going to be an amphitheater in Des Moines named after the guy of the, after this mm-hmm. this young man who's going to Second Baptist Church. There's going to be. He's going to see the world. He's going to sing on stages all over Europe and the United States and, and the Met and on and on and on. I, it's just amazing what happens when we let God write our story. And mm. and for you to – what really stands out for me and inspires me, Simon, and I think especially in – it's such a timely message for us uh, right now uh, because the news continues to uh, point us to uh, racial injustices that happen uh, all around, right here in the Midwest, and mm-hmm. all around our country, and all around the world, uh, it seems to me that, and in in our conversations, you've told me this many times before, that ultimately, if we're really serious about breaking down those barriers, that it's going to have to be a God thing. The power of love is not to be underestimated. And on that note, let's yeah. move into our second question. Yeah, that is, how have you found the strength to deal with racial prejudice throughout your life? It has been on the Bible's principles. We only have one race. It's the human race. I believe that God made us different to test the quality of our character. Can we love someone else if they don't look the way we look? I think he made us different colors, different shapes of eyes to test us. And the reason I don't have hate in my heart a bishop uh, of the Methodist Church, in fact, the whole Midwestern part of the United of, of the Midwest of the United States, he asked me one time. I had a lunch with him, and he said, "Simon, why don't you have heart, hatred in your heart?" And it only took me about two seconds to say, "I don't have any room in my heart for hate. I only have my heart full of love. Huh. My heart is full of love. Full of love. That means that." I have Jesus in my heart. Mm. And my mother, my father told me not to hate white people, no matter what they did to us. Mm. There was a lot of sadness that I experienced, not for myself personally, but for my father growing in Centerville, a man who couldn't read or write. And he was discriminated against. He had a chance to get a job at a bank as a custodian, and they wouldn't give it to him because he was colored. Because if you work in a bank, that gave you a little dignity or prestige, even if it was a janitor or custodian. But the man told him, no, I can't give you that job, but we have some gardening around our house Mm. that you could do because you wouldn't be able to handle it working in a bank. Mm. I remember when I got older, I heard from my father. It must have been very painful for him Mm -hmm. uh, when these acts of discrimination dealt with him and his family. And so, but Centerville was no different from any other city in Iowa. That's just the way it was 82 years ago. Yeah, and that prepared you for your future. I know that as you broke through and became uh, a very famous opera singer, that you had earned the right to sing at the Met in New York and and in the Lyric Opera House in Chicago, uh, where I grew up. But since I grew up in the city of Chicago, on the north side of the city, in a neighborhood that was predominantly German and Italian, uh, and so the prejudice ran deep. And our public schools where I attended, the prejudice ran deep. And so when they desegregated those schools and suddenly there were African-American students coming from the west and the south sides of Chicago to our north side high school, the tensions ran high. Um, and so when, I, when I've talked to you, Simon, and you've told me about your experience getting into the Lyric Opera House in Chicago and getting into the Met in New York, those were really delayed for you. Uh, where the Opera House in San Francisco gave you opportunities that they didn't, but eventually you broke through. How did you, how did you have that kind of patience? And it, what, what kept you from developing a chip on your shoulder and, and getting angry? Once again, it goes back to my mother and my father. 
having experienced that as a child growing up in Centerville. I want to mention something very interesting, I hope. I remember one time in the third grade, I was sent to the principal's office, and her name was Ellen Clark, the principal. I guess I must have done something naughty. I don't remember what it was, but I had to go there. And I remember she said to me, and there was a big safe in her office, and she said something that has never left my memory bank. She said, if you ever get sent to my office again, she said, you see that safe over there? I'm going to put you in there, and I'm going to lock the door and there is no air in there and you will suffocate to death. I have never forgotten somebody saying that to me as a child of maybe seven or eight Mm. years of age. But I would tell my mother these things and I I cannot tell, tell you, Pastor Mike and Emily, I had a great mother and a great earthly father. They only talked about love. My father and my mother never said a negative thing about white people. The only thing my mother said, and was in the form of a statement or a question, she would say, I just don't know why these white people treat us colored people this way. Mm. That was the strongest statement Mm. or question that she ever said. Mm -hmm. And so I got the strength to deal with not being able to sing in the opera houses in my own country. By that time, I'd been sung in Berlin and Hamburg and Munich and London and Rome. I sang in all these major opera houses. I remember I called my mother when I was living in New York City. I was in tears, and I'm not ashamed that I cried. I mean, after all, Jesus wept, so if he cried, Mm. I could cry too. And I said, Mother, I've sung in all these opera houses, and they won't let me sing in the Metropolitan Opera House and some of the other opera houses in my country. And she said, well, now, son, you just get down on your knees and you pray. Well, I did. And now I've sung in all the major opera houses in the United States. I've sung in 84 opera houses all around the world. Wow. But only because my mother told me never to give up and never to hate and pray. Wow. Mm. Simon, that's 84 more opera houses than I personally have sung in <laughs> uh, my, myself. So I've, be, I've been to the Lyric Opera House in Chicago, but I, they did not allow me anywhere near the stage. I was in the <laughs> highest balcony uh, watching from the second to back row. I think that's where I belong. Uh, wow. for, for sure. Lyric? Go to the Lyric? Yes. Uh, oh, our, wow. our, yeah, I took our, uh, Sally and I took our daughter there when she was in high school because she was just, um, you know, in love with, with all of that kind of music. And so right. it was a great experience. Yeah. Well, on that note, the next question is, what is it like to stand on the biggest stages of the world before popes and presidents and royalty? You know, I look at it with humility and I feel very humbled because many years ago, black people couldn't even go to the opera, let alone let alone sing in them. And so I feel humbled and honored. God is the one who gave me this talent to sing. I didn't know anything about opera going up into Centerville, Iowa. In fact, when I was a student at the University of Iowa, I wanted to sing in the university choir. And I went to Harold Stark, who was the head of the music department and the voice department. And I said, me, I sing in the choir. He said, no, 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 your voice isn't good enough. (laughs) He was the main voice teacher. So I said, well, can I take voice lessons with you? And he said, no, no, no. He said, you have no talent. I wouldn't waste my time with you. He said, however, there's a young teacher coming here this fall. Maybe he will take you. And I said, well, that's okay. I just want to sing. And that was Mr. Charles Kellis, the man who discovered me and introduced me to opera. But I just feel honored every time. I went. Can you imagine a little skinny colored kid in Centerville singing in the arena that the Romans built in Orange, Francis, like Verona, and to have sung in Rome mm. and in Covent Garden, where we had British royalty. And I have sung for a number of kings and queens, but I don't look at them any more than I do the people who scrubbed the floors mm. in the barber shop in Centerville, Iowa, which I did, or who cleaned toilets, which I did. Mm. I feel we are all people, we're all children of God. And some people have titles. Yes, I've sung for popes. I sang Archbishop Desmond Tutu, sang with the Billy Graham Crusade in Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. I've sung for two popes, even though I'm not Catholic. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the most important part, all these people that I mention are men of God. Mm -hmm. And I'm very grateful for Mike Householder being the great shepherd of all of the people in his field. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Thank you, Simon. I'm I I uh, that's too kind. I I uh, I'm just blown away when I think about all the places that God has has brought you, all the all the places where you've been able to sing and have this opportunity and um, to uh, to 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 say again though that it's the friendship I have with you. It's it's those things like what you just said right there. That talk about a perspective. Mm. So what are we living for? Is is it fame? Here, here's someone, mm-hmm. uh, Simon, you, who has tasted fame uh, mm-hmm. uh, on the highest levels of opera mm-hmm. uh, for years and years. And again, it gets back to, yeah, but there's something more. There's something deeper. And so to hold on to the humility that you have in the midst of that and also to have a perspective and say, sure, it's an honor to sing before all these prestigious people. And I'm sure that that was... You know, you're not going to forget that. That's that's a great experience. But I know you, and I know that um, singing for eternity in the kingdom of heaven is is going to be your greatest stage, uh, and that's going to be a wonderful, wonderful thing too. We know there's music in heaven, and we know we're going to all gather together, and there's not going to be any social distancing. Yeah, because there's no viruses. It's it's going to be wonderful. So uh, yes. we will we will enjoy that very much. Simon, you are lovely, and we are very thankful that you're in our church family. How did you find Lutheran Church of Hope? One of my wife's daughters, when you folks were putting up that big cross in the church, and she was a member, and she said to her mother, who is now my wife, she said, you should go to that church. The minister is really fantastic, and they've got this huge cross that they're in the process of, of in, installing, mm. I guess was a word. I don't remember the exact word. And so my wife and I, we went one Sunday. And I remember I was so touched not only to see that big cross, uh, which was very, very heavy. And I imagine Mike, Pastor Mike, they put it up with cranes and everything. That's right. It just made me think of the cross that Jesus had to carry. And then they, as far as I understand history, that was a black man who helped him carry that cross. And I heard Pastor Mike speak, and I was very touched that this man who had this big church in ter- terms of numbers, but he spoke with humility, and I, and I felt love from the message that he spoke. And uh, even though I didn't grow up in a Lutheran church, uh, incidentally, I, in Eisenhoff, Germany, I've sung there, and I've been in the place where uh, Luther <laughs> wrote and translated the Bible, I have actually been in that room. Amazing. And I look at churches as uh, houses of God. In the Old Testament, God always calls it the house of God or the Lord's house. And so I don't think we really need to have these adjectives uh, modify a noun regarding the church. It's just a church of God, whether it's Lutheran or Baptist or Presbyterian or Church of God in Christ. They're all houses of worship. And what I have appreciated and why I go quite often to the church there with a householder is a church that has people of all colors, all eye shapes, et cetera, et cetera. It's a church that represents what God wanted us to have and to realize that we are all children of God. Mm. Thank you, Simon. You've, you've uh, given us more than we've given you as a church, that's for sure, uh, in not just your music, but your presence and your wisdom has been, as I said before, a big influence on me. So uh, you've also gotten very involved in our mission uh, projects here and in mission projects that the Lord has led you to, and we want to ask about that as well. Yeah, our last question is, what are some of the mission projects near and dear to your heart these days? Well, they're still in my heart. Uh, I remember when they were, the church was raising money for the malaria project. I gave a nice donation to the church, but then the Lord led me to do more than just that. So I did a number of performances of singing right here in the state of Iowa. A lot of people don't know this. I did a big concert at the Hilton Coliseum Mm -hmm. in uh, 2013, and I had students, over a thousand students from 52 different high schools, and we did a Christmas concert. We raised Mm $100,000, and I'm a uh, with the United Nations Foundation, nothing but Nets Department. But I reala- realized these children were still needlessly dying in Africa, and I'm sure you folks know the statistics. So God led me to do this. I did a number of concerts here in Iowa. 
and including the $100,000 that uh, we raised with that Christmas concert with all of those children in it for the choir. Joseph Junta conducted with the Des Moines Youth Symphony Orchestra. I sang a lot of concerts in 50 different counties here in Iowa. And I said I would give all of the money to the United Nations Foundation, nothing but nets. So including the 100,000, I raised another 400, and thirty-two thousand, so five hundred and thirty-two thousand dollars, I gave to the United Nations Foundation, nothing but nets to buy nets for these children who were needlessly dying from malaria. And then I didn't know who it was, but they wrote a beautiful letter to me from the foundation. Somebody, an anonymous donor, who heard what I did with here in Iowa with these high school and predominantly white students, sent two hundred and sixty-five thousand, and another person sent one hundred thousand. Mm. So that. 532,000 generated almost a million dollars. And we saved hundreds of children's, thousands of children's lives in Africa. Mm. And so my mission still is to help these children in Africa. And all I want to do, the Lord has granted me 82 years. I just want to serve him the rest of my life and to serve people because we're put on this earth to be servants of the Lord's, not service of one particular group of people. So we'll use this as our transition into the deeper dive uh, in our conversation today. But when you speak to children at school, Simon, you talk about your hope for them and, and, and your direction for their lives, and you talk about it on different levels. Would you, would you please share that? Because I find that what you say to children is something that adults should hear too, and Emily and I are a captive audience. So mm-hmm. what, what do you say at these school events to these children, and what can we as adults pull off from this as well? After each concert that I have sung in these 55, 56 counties now in Iowa, the very next day they have a general assembly and all of the high school students in that county come. And I talk about them, I talk to them about the importance of parts of our lives that we all need. We need three forms of nutrition. We need food for our bodies to develop. And so we try to eat healthy. And I tell them then, it says in the book of Proverbs, to get knowledge, to get understanding, above all, get wisdom. That's education, to get knowledge. And so I say, we give knowledge to our brains by going to school and get an education. And then I tell them I'm a Christian. And I said, I feel we need spiritual nourishment, three forms of nourishment. And I get my spiritual nourishment by reading my Bible every day and praying, and going to church. And I could go on and on to both of you, but I want to tell you both right now with humility, every one of these counties that I have spoken with these children, I tell them that God has given every one of them a talent. Mm -hmm. And they should just sit quietly, even though they're young, and think, what do I want to do on earth? Mm -hmm. And find out what that is, because we are all given a talent, even if it's shining shoes or scrubbing a floor. My parents taught me whatever job you do, you do it well and do it properly. But I tell them that God loves them. I tell them that I'm a Christian. And I tell them even though I've had this what we call worldly success, it means absolutely nothing. I've just been blessed and we're put on this earth. And so whenever I sing, before I sing, I say, Lord, I hope and pray that somebody out there in the audience, that their hearts will be touched to love you and to love one another. And so I tell the children, be kind to one another. Don't be a bully. We all have weakness and we all have strengths. And I tell them to love each other and to help each other. And I think I can say more than 90% when I finish these assemblies, the children come up and say, can they have a selfie? selfie?" Or they'll say, we've never met someone like you. You're famous. And yet and still, you're not ashamed of your faith. And I say, no, we shouldn't ever be ashamed of our faith. Our faith comes from God, and God is love. People are always asking, who or what is God? God is love, Mm. and God is a noun, and God is a verb. Mm. I tell them God is a noun because he's the creator of all, and he became a verb. When Jesus came on the earth, his one and only begotten son, and went into action. That's why love is so all-encompassing. And I tell them about the importance of taking care of their bodies and being kind to one another. I said, if you're better in math, in history, then each of you help one another. 
because we're put on the world, put on this earth to be helpers. And I just feel blessed and honored. And I, I just pray all the time. The first time I read the Bible to was with my mother, Pastor, when I was 11 years old. She said, son, all you have to do is read three chapters a day on five on Sunday. And you complete the Bible in a, in a year. So I did that. And when my precious wife, Obaid, and I got married, we decided to start our first year of marriage out by reading the Bible through together. Mm-hmm. And it was so good we finished it in seven months. Mm-hmm. And the church that we were going to, and I was at Wardwood College, sorry about that because I know your daughter went to Luther, but that's okay. <laughs> and, uh, I love Wartburg too. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, uh, and so I said to uh, my mother, uh, my no, I lost my point when I thought of Luther and Wartburg. You, you were reading the Bible with your... Oh, yeah, reading the Bible, right, right, right. And so one Sunday, I wasn't at church in, in Waverly. I was simply singing in the world. My mother said, minister. And believe it or not, it was a Church of the Brethren. Okay. And the minister said, why don't all of you people in the congregation uh, read the Bible through in a year? And so my wife told me that's a about this when I came back home. So she said, let's do it, Simon. So she said, I'll do it chronologically, and you can go Genesis through Revelation. I said, okay. So we finished it through. So I've read the Bible through from cover to cover for for uh, all my whole life, mm-hmm. but I still read it every day. Simon, you have such a strong faith, and I know from the conversations that we've had that you, and you said this just a moment ago, that, that that faith is, is and God is a noun and a verb, and our faith is a noun and a verb too. And so it's something that you put into action. When we talk, I know you have joy in your heart. I know you have love in your heart. And I also know that you have hope for this world uh, and, and you have concern for this world. Good Christian concern, well-placed concern. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, prejudice earlier and how you were able to navigate your way through that as somebody who was on the receiving end of that prejudice. <laughs> what what would you say, uh, given the news that's going on in the world today, uh, what is the Christian's responsibility to love on one hand, but also to take action and to stand up for justice on the other? How do you find that balance? Because I know you do, I know your heart and I know that love to you doesn't just mean passively sitting back and doing nothing. That love actually stirs you to action and, and to um, seeking justice. So how do you find that balance? I find the balance in the Bible. I really do, Pastor. And this is why I read my Bible every day. Because the Bible is God speaking to us. And he tells us there will be difficulties in life and there will be injustices in life. But we have to let love rule and understanding. I want to share something very quickly with you. Two years ago, my wife was in the hospital here in Des Moines. She, her, she thought she was having a heart attack. And her mm-hmm. sister was also a registered nurse, as is my wife. Mm-hmm. She took her to the hospital. And I was in Ohio driving. And I kept calling and nobody answered. Well, I'll try to make this story very short. But anyhow, there I was just in a line following the traffic. And this happened to me just two years ago. And we came up over this hill. I remember in front of me was a white Chevrolet suburban car. Behind me was an older Taurus red car. Mm -hmm. And I saw there was a white lady driving the white car and a white man driving the car. And I was in the middle of them. And it was just a whole string of cars. Mm -hmm. And we came up over this hill. And there was a patrolman there with a radar gun. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I saw him jump in his car. And I said to my wife over the phone, I said, you know, I think the patrolman is coming. He came. And so anyhow, he stopped me. He asked for a driver's license and everything. Hmm. And he said, uh, you know, you were speeding. I said, well, and I was on the phone with my wife. Maybe I shouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I was just following the flow of traffic. Mm -hmm. I said, but there was a car in front of me and a car in front of that car and a car car behind me. And I said, I was just going in flow of traffic. I said, well, why did you stop me? He said, well... I decided I needed to stop someone, so I stopped you. And he said, so give me your license. I said, officer, and I had both of my hands on the steering wheel, and I was shaking. Mm -hmm. I said, "Uh, my license is in my left hip pocket. And I said, I have to reach for it. I said, so please don't shoot me. I said, please Mm -hmm. don't shoot me. And he said, well, I'm not going to shoot you. Just give me your license. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to put my hand very carefully back, and I don't have a gun. 
Mm-hmm. And so I reached back, I got my license, and my hands were shaking. I could hardly, I'm telling the honest truth, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, I was scared. Mm-hmm. And I gave him my license, and he went back to his car, and then he came back, and he said, you know, he said, when you said, don't shoot me, he said, so you took a knife and stabbed me in my stomach. I said, but officer, I didn't mean to do that. Mm-hmm. I said, I said, I was just, I was just nervous. And he said, well, let me tell you something. He said, if you had your hands up and if you started to lower them, he said, then I would shoot you. I was so scared because I thought I could have been shot by that patrolman. Yeah. And I will never forget that. It was two years ago. Mm. And I, I, and I never called him a racist. Right. But he stopped me. I said, why? He said, well, I had to stop somebody. So I decided I would stop you. I know the police officers I've talked to in this church family say this just breaks my heart when we hear stories like what happened in Minneapolis with George Floyd or, or stories uh, of any kind of uh, racial profiling. Mm-hmm. It is not the majority. It is the minority. It is not all police officers, but they make they 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 diminish trust. Mm-hmm. And that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking to police officers, too. Uh, but your story, Simon, uh, I wanted to say that as the prelude to just my reaction to it and my response to it is so telling. Here you are, the most gentle soul mm-hmm. that I know, and you're getting pulled over. And here's something that somebody like me will never even have to think twice about. And so anybody who thinks, oh, it's all just the same, that, that being uh, white or African-American in this country is the same, I know that we never had to teach our kids when you get pulled over. We told them, if you ever get pulled over for a traffic ticket, be respectful, be honorable, just listen, just say yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, whoever it might be. But what we never have to do is what my African-American friends tell me they have to teach their kids. You put your hands on the wheel. You look straight ahead. If you're going to move your hands, you like you just relayed, Simon, yeah. you tell the police officer, I'm moving my hand now to get my license. And, and you have to do that because of mm-hmm. the very small minority. Again, the overwhelming majority would never put anybody at risk like that. But the small minority who make it hard for everybody and – and make it unjust for people of a particular race. And that is, that's something that ought to trouble all of us mm-hmm. on a deep level. Mm-hmm. I mean, on just a deep level. That's sin, that's evil, that's mm-hmm. darkness. Uh, and we need to shine light into those places. The Bible says this. It says, Proverbs 31, verse 8, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are being crushed. And so if you have a platform, if you have a voice, use it uh, for the sake of speaking out for justice. Speaking that justice and that truth in love, always in love, mm-hmm. never for the sake of... Because if we, if we return hatred with hatred, we're just going to compound the problem. But if we return hatred with love, Simon, as is, is we started the conversation uh, there, and justice and telling our stories... It shines light into dark places, and the darkness is gonna is gonna flirt, is gonna is gonna run away. Darkness can't handle light. Light mm-hmm. always wins, and I suppose that's the hope and, and the good news. Sadly, we have to wrap up. This has been such a fun conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Emily, what strikes you in the conversation today? What 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 would be the mic drop moment, Simon? We say this at the end. It's called the Pastor Mic Drop Podcast, as I know you know. And so we're talking about what are the mic drop moments for each of us? What are, what are we going to take away from this conversation? Emily, mm-hmm. how about you? Yeah. Well, I have a lot. Simon, you are uh, obviously filled with love and humility and wisdom, and this has been a privilege to talk with you today. I think uh, it would be easy for you to say I was put on this earth uh, to sing, to go all over the world and, and to get to do those things, but that's not what you kept saying. You, you talked about how we're all put here. Uh, with gifts uh, to be servants of the Lord. And that really stands out for me. And I think the other thing that really stood out to me is you are filled with knowledge of the Bible. And obviously that's because you have great spiritual disciplines um, and we can all do that. And uh, I think that that is what makes you filled with love and uh, humility and wisdom. And that's that's great uh, lessons for all of us. So well said. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Simon, what will you take away from the conversation today? What, what stands out for you? It stands out that we have <clears throat> a man, two men, and a woman. 
who are all three of us, I do believe are filled with love and we're filled with God. We're full of God and all three of us want peace. I will say something, Pastor. I was filling up my car at Sam's Club recently and this man said, oh, Simon, he got out of his car and he said, well, I want to thank you for all that you do for the people in Iowa. And I said, I recognize your face, but he said, my name is Nathan Falk and I go to Hope Lutheran Church. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said to me, Mike Householder is such a wonderful man. I said, oh, he is. I said, you know, I've actually had dinner with him and his wife and my <laughs> wife. And he said, Simon, if there's anything I can do for you, let me know and I will do it. Well, he's asked me several times to sing at the Capitol huh. to honor the policemen and the highway patrolmen of the state of Iowa. And I've done it every year except when I was away one time and I got one of my students to sing for him. But I get from this time with the three of us together, we are just children of God. And I'm grateful that all three of us are Christ's followers. We're Christians. We love the Lord. And let's just keep trying to bring some more love into the world and get people not to hate each other, not to kill each other, and not to say bad things about each other. My mother always said, turn the other cheek. That's what Jesus says to do, to love your enemies. That's hard to do sometimes, but love is stronger. As you just said, Pastor, love is stronger than hate. Love will rule. Truth will rule. Kindness will rule over bitterness and hatred. So I say to both of you, God bless you both. I love you. And see you one of these days in the church once we get over this virus. That sounds really good. We're looking forward to that. Look forward to hearing you sing again. Uh, my mic drop moment is very simple and very short. It's just that Simon lives who he is, that mm. his faith uh, plays out in his daily life. I've seen it. I've witnessed it. Uh, I think we're all getting a taste of that here in this conversation again today. You are as genuine as they come, Simon. And I am always most impressed with humble people, mm. uh, especially those who wouldn't have to be. I think that's why I was such a big fan of Billy Graham. And you mentioned that you sang at one of Billy Graham's crusades. Uh, I, I'm, I'm always a big fan of church leaders who maybe could say, oh, well, look at everything that I've done, but they aren't so impressed with themselves. Uh, I think that's you, Simon. I think you're more impressed with God than you are with yourself. Uh, you yeah. are, that said, a gift to the opera world, a gift to the state of Iowa, a gift to our church family. Uh, and so I want to just say again, thank you for being you uh, and what a joy it is to be your friend. VBS is right around the corner, yes, right, Emily? It is. We're real excited about that. Uh, we just celebrated confirmation uh, recently for hundreds and hundreds, 500 plus eighth yeah. grade students. So things, wheels are still moving around here. God is still on the move. Uh, because God is not limited by our physical separation, and he keeps showing up by his, through his Holy Spirit in these ways. So mm -hmm. thank you uh, for being uh, a part of the Pastor Mike Drop podcast family. Thanks again, Simon. Thank you, Emily. Thanks to the crew, and we'll see you again next time. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today to the Pastor Mike Drop podcast. We would invite you on whatever app you are on to rate and review us to help get the word out. And in the meantime, if you can join us for worship, we would love to have you. We'll see you there. Oh, I'm the typical